Packing a punch like Tyson Fury in a bad mood. More might, more might. It tastes like bacon and old people. There's nothing quite like Marmite. Love it. Oh, I hate it. For good or bad. Marmite opens your mind, it broadens your horizons. I hate it. I love it. <laughs> a taste of the black stuff oh. is extraordinarily divisive. But why is that? And crucially, can you move from one side of the Great Divide to the other? It's a uh -uh. We'll examine the science of taste. Marmite brownies? Yeah! Show how this product is surprisingly healthy. Eat your greens or eat Marmite. That's crazy. And how it contributed to victory in two world wars. I promise to do my duty to Queen, country and Marmite. Wow! That's deep. <laughs> Featuring fanaticism. We're the world's only Marmite wedding. <laughs> Beyond the call of mere yeast extract. Lovers. I'm the only one in the family that loves it. And haters. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> it's time to analyse the siren call. Oh my god. And repellent nature of one of Britain's most iconic and two faced brands. <laughs> There are very few foods that the British put on a culinary pedestal. Fish and chips reputation has reached mythical levels. And the simple cheese sandwich is lauded the length and breadth of the nation. But there's little as quintessentially British and yet as fundamentally divisive as Marmite. Yes, Marmite is the Trump. It's the Donald oh, Trump of, really of spreads on toast. To find out why, and whether this has to be, we've assembled a motley collection of friends and foes. Are we recording? Oh, is it working? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I think okay. it's, it's working. working. Bam. Lovely. Some of them love a drop of this dark, mysterious spread. Ready? Ready. Ready! I buy it frequently. Right. What would you put it on? Usually toast. And others think it is the spawn of the devil. Oh. It's not normal, I don't think, to like Marmite. It's weird. But where does the nation actually sit on the Great Divide? Are there more lovers lurking amongst us than haters? In 2011, a survey revealed they were evenly matched. But what's happened since then? Which side will prevail? Well, there's been yeast extract-based mayhem. Because in 2019, 46% of us were lovers, and 36% haters, with the rest neutral. One nil to the lovers. <laughs> but why is it so divisive? I think it's a matter of just, it's in our genes. It depends on who, like, on the person. Could partiality be genetic? Is it nature or nurture? In 2017, a glossy viral video showed scientists teaming up with our yeasty brand to investigate. Through scientific research, we've developed a test for these genetic markers that contribute to whether you love or hate Marmite. It linked with the brand's humorously effective advertising. Yes! They're here! It's a good idea. Yeah, I don't know how scientifically accurate it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, though, what if it came back that you did like Marmite and then you don't? Yeah. Does that mean you have to eat it? Well, oh, Annabelle, your result came back that you do like Marmite, oh. therefore you've got to have that. Yeah, I did get a point. <laughs> get in, all lovers. Oh, I, knew I it. hate it! I don't think it's genetic, I just think it's a bad flavour. <laughs> Stop trying to blame me for their bad product. It's a clever advert. I, I would good. do what that little boy did. I'd just run off. I'd never want to try it again. Yeah. Sadly, the campaign didn't prove a solely genetic link to La Morde Yeasty Goo. So I know there have been some studies done on um, Marmite, on whether you can kind of put people into two groups of Marmite lovers and Marmite haters. Sometimes I like Marmite, sometimes I hate Marmite. Depends on my mood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not exactly sure whether you really can classify people like that, but certainly our taste buds are, um, you know, our tastes are formed by a combination of nature and nurture. Here we go, guinea pigs. It doesn't always work, but if you want your kids to love the stuff, best start them early. 
So when you're younger, the more taste you're introduced to... Right. Would you like to try some Marmite? The more likely it is that you'll go on to um, enjoy a really wide range of foods. <laughs> yeah, I always remember those days of eat it all or you're not leaving the table. <laughs> you might like it. What do you reckon? Nice? Oh, no, I don't like it. Fair enough. But surely yeast extract is too savoury for tiny humans. Babies actually have a real preference for sweet flavours. I like it. A bit bitter. But startlingly, even young children can develop a taste for it because breast milk contains a surprising secret ingredient. Interestingly, breast milk also contains um, glutamate, which is what gives the kind of umami flavour to foods. And this is umami, as strong and savoury as they come. I can't tell you what it is about the taste that I like. It's just so strong. I mean, to me, it tastes like super beefy. You know, I love beef-flavoured things, so it's like you can't get much stronger than Marmite, really, so I love the stuff. What do you think, River? Mmm. Oh, darling. Oh, no. I wish I'd persevered with you and then you'd be eating it now. <laughs> Maybe you'd run even faster. For some of us, though, a love of the black stuff is always going to be out of reach. There are some people um, who are what we call super tasters. Oh! <laughs> God, that's not nice. It's, it's when you get that burn on the back of your throat. But yeah, but you're real practically drinking it by the bottle. <laughs> they, in particular, taste bitter tastes really, really strongly. It's bitter. It's so bitter and Beautiful. salty. Why? Why Beautiful. is that? Why do you like that? Some of those people will go on to be what you would kind of describe as quite picky eaters because they actually find some of the taste quite overwhelming. Are you proud of yourself? No. Because it's awful. <laughs> so, my GCSE biology expertise suggests your genes are better at making you loathe than love. It's now all square. A complaint to the examiners if you're upset. Coming up, a rookie faces his fears. I'm kind of looking forward to opening it. I've never smelt Marmite before. The sticky stuff's unpromising origins. That's astonished me. That it's literally just what people were going to throw away and the perils of eating yeast extract by the spoonful. <laughs> yeast extract. A simple spread with the ability to divide the nation. We're lovers or haters. And in our head-to-head -head contest, it's currently neck and neck. Now, round three, a battle for the soul of a Marmite virgin. I'm kind of looking forward to opening it. I've never smelt Marmite before. Tension rises to unbearable levels. Oh, good God. It's a roller coaster of taste. Will Dominic raise a smile? Oh, my God. Why is it so salty? I've got to spit out. Sorry, sorry. No, no. Oh, no. Nope. That's another implacable foe, then. Jesus. Two one to the haters. You can't argue with a newcomer's taste buds, can you? It was Dominic's first go, but when were we Brits first introduced to this salty syrup of the gods? Stroke spawn of the devil. It's like any story. It goes way further back than you realise. Do you think it was when it was like the, the Black Plague? That isn't that like hundreds of years ago, isn't it? <laughs> 1950. Go on, that's a good year. I reckon that's right. Not even close, mate. Our story begins in the mid 19th century. In a different country and a different product. There was this really keen scientist, a German, Justus von Liebig, a baron, no less, who was very keen on trying to discover how you could create a product which was an extract of meat, making it cheaper but highly nutritious. And eventually, in 1847, he made that breakthrough moment and he started to create this product, Liebig's Extract of Meat, Liebig had captured the essence of meat's flavour and created an iconic brand. 
OXO. But his extraction process was adaptable. And in 1902, British scientists used Liebig's ideas to create our divisive spread, using a pretty unpalatable product. Marmite is made from yeast extract, which is a product of um, the brewing industry, a kind of waste product. An old timber building houses the brewery of the only English pub that brews its own beer. Dick Holding is the man who sees to it that the Golden Lion never runs short. After brewer's yeast has converted sugar into alcohol, it turns into a thick, pale, pretty disgusting slurry. This sludge was once, rightfully you may think, discarded. But now this waste product forms the unlikely basis of an actual food. And you expect that to be nice when they add ingredients to it. Give, give over. Give, come on now. That definitely, definitely, definitely tastes like a waste product. 100%. That's astonished me that it's literally just what people were going to throw away. Today we still consume a lot of products that perhaps some would regard as waste products. This is particularly true in the meat industry. Say, for example, if you were to buy a mass-produced burger or a chicken nugget, it's not made from fillet steak or fine chicken breasts. Instead, it's mechanically reclaimed meat from the carcasses of animals, something which has been known in the past as pink goo. Sausages are another good example. I mean, when you're paying 26p for four sausages, what do you think's in them? Testicles. Uh, uh, thank you, Annie. Actually, testicles are really nice. I had them in a restaurant in Brussels, and I've got to say, a sheep's testicle. The haters have a case. Our acrimonious spread's origins aren't pretty. In fact, they're a bit yucky. Technical term. So, we're giving the haters an extra point for basic foodie common sense. Sorry, lovers, I make the rules. But how is this controversial product actually made? First, salt's added and then it's heated, which breaks down the cell walls to release the essence of yeast. The resulting liquid centrifuged and sieved before being heated again to evaporate off the water. This leaves a thick yeast extract ready to be sieved still further and flavoured. It's kind of sort of condensed down and they add celery and salt and spices, a kind of special secret mix. And then more recently they've been adding B12, folic acid, thiamine and riboflavin, so really good sources of B vitamins. Ingredients are Barley, wheat, oats, rye, salt, vegetable juice, vitamin B12, and folic acid, natural flavouring, contained celery. Who'd have thought it contained celery? I just assumed it was like yeast and chemicals, to be perfectly honest. I thought there was some kind of, you know, alchemy yeah. going on to get that to make it the way it is. Yeah. But it's actually quite natural. Yeah, I mean, I like the look of the ingredients list of Marmite. It's a nice short list, and when you're looking at food, the really the shorter the, the ingredients list or the better. So, uh, yeah, no problem with any of those. But no clue in all this as to why it's called what it's called. How do you think they come up with that name? How do you think they come up with a name Marmite? Marmite. Marmite. The guy that made it, maybe? I actually have no idea. Mom might like it. His name is like Jeremy Marmite. <laughs> Why does Jeremy Marmite sound so funny? I, I feel like it comes from around. It's not a name you'd usually hear. Unless it's German. Um, Aberdeen. Actually, this very British product has a French name. Well, Marmite, or Marmite as it would be pronounced in France, is actually a stew pot. And in fact, the shape of the bottle reflects the shape of a French marmite. As you can probably guess from the shape of the marmite jar, it's a pot-bellied casserole which goes up and over and has a little lid to stick on top of it. And there is the stew pot on the front of the marmite jar on this glorious label which they devised for its launch in 1902. Oh, yeah! <laughs> a little cooking <laughs> pot. Ah. Why are we so sh God, we're thick, aren't we? There is a cooking pot. Yeah. A British icon with a French name? Sacre bleu. We can't be having that. Surely it should just be called pot bellied casserole. That's 4 1. The haters are walking it. Of course, I'm impartial. 
At launch, and despite its Gallic name, it was an immediate success. And its arrival was a timely one. When Marmite was launched in 1902, nutrition was a subject on a lot of people's minds. There'd been a lot of work done to analyse the diet of the poor, and the discoveries that were made were truly shocking. Around a third of the nation would have been qualified as unfit to fight in the event of a war. There was, therefore, quite a large market for things that delivered a level of nutrition and also flavour punch for very little money. Over the next decade, our intrepid spread went from strength to strength. And when war broke out in 1914, it was ordered straight to the front line. Marmite grew in importance during the First World War. There were food shortages at home, which meant that something like Marmite was really, really useful to boost the flavours of those foods that were left. And for some of the soldiers serving either in the trenches of Flanders or as prisoners of war in the various camps, Marmite sometimes found its way into food rations. It's a taste of home. Mm. That's amazing. I think uh, God, how wonderful. suffered so much. No. <laughs> To be fair, it could be reverse psychology. If you send me Marmite, I'm going to want to get home as soon as possible, so I'm going to go and win that war. We know that you have to have your B vitamins every day, and so I think, you know, sending Marmite out for them to have every day on their bread or their biscuits or whatever is a really, really good addition. But what about the soldiers who hated it? I'd rather be shot. <laughs> I'd rather be shot? Wow. My suggestion to them would be, um, hold your nose. Eat it quickly. In World War II, yeast extract's medicinal qualities were explored further still. It was actually prescribed to troops suffering from scrotal dermatitis. An ailment caused by a lack of B vitamins to the scrotum. Did they eat it or smear it on? What, to eat or to rub it on? Oh. Right. Mm -mm. If you're spreading it on, it's going to be quite painful because of the salt content. If you think about when you put salty water on wounds, if you've got a cut and you go in the sea. So, um, yeah, interesting. Thankfully, the potential cure was administered orally. You're making me feel sick, like actually sick. I'm being serious. Would you like another bite? No, thank you. And it's said to have worked. <sighs> I wonder I'm... if the doctor will prescribe it for us. I don't need to bite it anymore. Maybe it's just worth suffering. <laughs> <laughs> so, while haters prevaricated, yeast extract stood alongside Churchill, the Spitfire and the Dunkirk spirit to help win the war. One up for the lovers. In fact, two. One for each war. So yours delicious Marmite often. But from the 1950s, it was TV ads, not global conflict, that dictated the way the public viewed it. First, it broadened its appeal to be a universal cooking ingredient. It had such an exciting, savoury taste. So having it with hot food, as in meat, why would you do that? Why would... Why would you do that? It's a good idea. It is a good idea. I mean, it's definitely going to add more flavour, which is what they add for yeah. the most. I add it to casseroles, I add it to chilli. Um, I just really like the kind of meaty flavour that it gives things. Marmite. For better flavour, more goodness. For better flavour and more goodness. This unctuous spread was firmly marketed at mums and families until well into the 1970s, with health its biggest selling point. Marmite helps children to grow healthy and strong. Marmite, the growing up spread. I grew up on chocolate spread and I like to think I'm OK. The Maybe growing up not. spread? What the hell? <laughs> well, yeah, you grow up on it. <laughs> but from the 80s, irreverence replaced practicality. I think in recent times, certainly in my lifetime, the big Marmite campaigns have obviously been my mate, Marmite, which was very clever. It, it helped you bond with the brand. What, mate? Your mate, my mate. Marmite! <laughs> oh, that's... That's a good move. <laughs> Save it's... it. Pun. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's a good one. Yeah. Good pun. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, but that was good. It was just simple, wasn't it? My mate, who's mate? Her mate, who's mate? Marmite. I like, I yeah, like, I like that, it. Mate. I like it, mate. Yeah, mate. <laughs> I don't want to be friends with Marmite. What, mate? Marmite! <laughs> then in the 1990s, new radical ads. 
Madam Clean, just seen trying some marmite today. Cemented a divisive reputation. Ooh. Big pair of kahunas have ever come up with an ad campaign. Yeah, I've done one of them. There's a lot of psychology behind the Marmite Love It or Hate It campaign. It's a little bit like the tribalism around football teams. You don't really find people who say, oh, I don't really mind Man U, I'll support them if I have to, but sometimes it's all right to go with Arsenal, I think. So Marmite's a very clever campaign from that point of view. It's a bold move to come straight out and be like, Ah, you might not like it. As if they're trying to be like a really popular band. Like, mm, we might not be for you actually. We're, we're quite, we're quite cool. Maybe you wouldn't like us. Haters and lovers were satisfied by a counterintuitive campaign. I hate mama. Yes. Taking the Mickey out of themselves. It's so cool. It's good that they know their product's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> that is wicked. How that clever is, is so that? Clever. That advert, one hundred percent correct. I hate Marmite. Yeah, remember that. But one. why would you put an advert to hate Marmite? Then people won't buy it. Actually, sales soared. This almost century-old product went mainstream again. It's not often ad men manage to make dictionary compilers sit up and take notice. Love it or hate it, which has just become uh, crazy. I mean, it's uh, become part of the English language and uh, we express ourselves almost through the word Marmite. It's very clever. No one says, you know, they're a bit sprouts. <laughs> you know, and that's something else that people don't like yeah. or love. To be honest, I think I'd describe you as a bit <laughs> 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 I think I have been described as Marmite in the past. Yeah, I can imagine that. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> and it's not only entered the dictionary, it's gone viral, adding to the growing genre of taste test videos that flood the net from across the globe. Revolting and hilarious in equal measure. Today, I'm going to try a Marmite. It tastes like bacon and old people. Oh, oh, it cooked my mouth. Oh, God. What is this awful taste? Like, this is horrible. This is disgusting. This is probably one of the nastiest things I've tasted ever. Why? Why would you put this on toast? Oh, my God. Granted, not glowing endorsement, but to be fair, eating an ultra savoury spread by the spoonful has never been a recommended serving suggestion. Coming up, breakfast spread or secret cult? We are Marmorati. First circle, second circle. We protect the recipe. Is it superfood or over egged? Marmites actually seems to be. Um kind of given these superpowers, there's a lot of myths around about the kind of things that Marmite might do for you. And can a bit of bakery convert the antis? I'm sorry, haters, but you're gonna love it. Brownies are great. Why, why are we ruining it? Our contentious spread is people who wouldn't touch it with an extremely large extendable barge pole. But some people love it so much they sign up to a secret organisation. OK, marketing tool, where aficionados can gather to waffle on a bit. We are Marmorati. First circle, second circle. We protect the recipe. I promise to do my duty to Queen, country, and Marmite, I swear to be faithful and bear true allegiance to the Marmorati. I will defend the ebony elixir against all conspiracies, protect its distinctive flavour and honour its orb-like jar. What a load of trollop. Queen country Marmite, something that James Bond didn't say. Wow, <laughs> mate, I want to be part of that. Real? Yeah. Is it real? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't think it's real. Offer me all the money in the world. I am not joining. I promise to spread my dark and sticky mistress throughout the land, as well as on toast. <laughs> it's not my dark and sticky mistress, I'll tell you that right now. Um, no. 
It's just a naughty food. It's just got a sex appeal to it. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's deep. I'd say like mature cheddar sexy food. <sighs> <laughs> What is going on? And for Jen and Terry, Marmite changed their whole world. Marmite has played a significant role in every part of our life, seriously. We met over a cheese and Marmite sandwich. The first line Jen ever said to me was, is that a cheese and Marmite sandwich? With such perfect ingredients for romance, wedding bells soon followed. When it came to the big day, their true love no, their passion took centre stage. And we just thought, how cool would it be, because everyone knows us as the Marmite couple, how cool would it be to have that at our um, reception? It was a fantastic weekend, really, just full of Marmite everywhere. We had a Marmite chocolate cake, Marmite portions for people. Yeah. We had a one-of-a-kind Marmite hat. And for fanatics like them, it's all or nothing. A spreading quest for world domination. As a Marmite missionary, my official title in the Marmarati, I would continue to educate people globally. That is what we've done in 56 countries. We've taken Marmite and got lots and lots of people to try Random people in random settings on volcanoes, in jungles, in deserts. I reckon I could swear up to that oath. Yeah, but you've got to be like a die-hard fan. Yeah, but I secretly could be. Just like Simon Cowell says, it's a no from me. People who sign up to that should be on some kind of watch list, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Marmite opens your mind, it broadens your horizons. But broadening horizons isn't necessarily on the minds of people who encounter yeast extract away from these shores. Patriotic missionary work sometimes falls on fallow ground. The first problem is working out what it is. Oh, sweet chocolate. Wow. <laughs> That's smell. Mm hmm. <laughs> Terrible. And then there's getting to grips with the taste. Fill your boots, lads. <laughs> hey! Yeah. <sighs> Yummy! Hey! <laughs> Finished? <laughs> the jury's out on whether they can conquer the world. Yum. Not yum. <laughs> but at least lovers point to the fact their shadowy bow does you good. But good enough to merit an extra point to draw level? Because we are not like the scrawny products of the early 20th century. In modern Britain, we aspire to be buff and eat impeccably. But our yeasty friend's strong taste is characterised by saltiness and we're all being implored to reduce our salt intake. Surprisingly though, according to the experts, it's a winner. So Marmite is high in salt, but actually because it's got really strong flavour, it's not something that you're going to eat loads of. I mean, you know, you wouldn't eat a whole jar of Marmite. And the brand's other qualities show the old ads had a point when it came to health. One of the reasons that Marmite is good for us is that it's a really good source of B vitamins. It stops you getting too tired. Um, it's needed to keep your nervous system healthy and functioning. It's used to keep your skin in good condition. So it's mind altering in a good way. It can actually boost your brain. Which is not going to kill you. Makes you smarter. Well, that's why my brain hasn't worked for the last 30 years then, because I've not been having vitamins in the Marmite. It can even give Britain's favourite bicep bulges spinach and eggs a run for their money. So this here is an eight gram serving of Marmite, uh, packed full of B vitamins. To get the same amount of B vitamins, you would have to eat an absolute ton of spinach. Uh, you'd have to eat a couple of eggs. You'd have to eat a really good serving of breakfast cereal. Marmite is really good for them. Mm. That's, that's crazy. Maybe you need a Marmite on lettuce. Marmite on... What? No, stop. If you don't put Marmite on your toast, probably you're going to put honey or jam or marmalade and then you've got to look at the sugar content. So it's a kind of, you know, a balance. Let's eat more. Yay! No. <laughs> but while the oozy black spread does have some clear health pluses, it can't put hairs on your chest or replace what you've lost on top. 
despite advertising silliness. Stand by this morning for a cure to baldness. Relief comes in the shape of a jar of Marmite. Well, that's a new one. Marmite actually seems to be um, kind of given these superpowers. There's a lot of myths around about the kind of things that Marmite might do for you. Spread the stuff all over the top of your head. That's what I said. And the great thing about it, of course, you won't look silly. I'm not sure that I think spreading Marmite on your head is going to cure baldness. I can't see any scientific pathways that would uh, make that happen. But Claire's sound advice is wasted on some people. What well, if you ate it and put it on your head at the same time? So you'd like the whole lot? Not the whole lot. <laughs> Not the whole lot. <laughs> Brad around the hair in the morning. <laughs> oh, look, that is big. Look at that. <laughs> But its essential qualities mean despite the over-egging of its dark and sticky pudding, yeast extract deserves to score a point when it comes to health. Lovers, you're level. What I'll have to do, I think I'm going to smother the whole head because I think I might look a little bit stupid with just a little bit of hair. You yeah. think? Its health benefits have formed the basis of the brand's appeal for over a century. And it's become an unlikely but bona fide British institution. So... Tinkering with a product as distinctive as this is a risky business. In 2006, bosses experimented with trying to make their sticky stuff more wet and squeezy. Squeezable products were very much the story at the beginning of this millennium. Everybody wanted to produce something with the flexible plastic that was more modern and more convenient, and Marmite wanted to do the same. But to make Marmite squeezable, they had to make it a little bit more liquid. And that's a danger. Does it taste the same? The jury's out. And its distinctive flavour has seen it expand into unexpected areas. In 2020, advertising creatives were set a daunting challenge. Links for... What? A Marmite? What? and created a bold, tongue-in-cheek ad to launch a shower gel smelling of yeast. No, why would you put that on your skin? Oh, it's on my hair. <gasps> you see, it even looks like Marmite. Why would Lynx do that? <laughs> you might attract Marmite lovers, but then you're going to stink at the same time. Even if you like Marmite, you have to admit, it stinks. It's a thumbs up for me. It smells nice. I like this. One product that has stuck around, some might say like a bad smell, is a competitor, Vegemite. The love it or hate it spread from down under. Launched in Australia in the 1920s, its promotional campaigns have been cosy rather than confrontational. We're happy little Vegemites as bright as bright can be. We all enjoy our Vegemite for breakfast, lunch and tea. As bright and sunny as Christmas on Bondi Beach. But there's one thing we all agree on. We love our Vegemite. Take it away, Aussie Ken. We're happy little Vegemites. We're happy as can be. We all like our Vegemite for breakfast, lunch and tea. See that? That's the kind of vibe I want. But down under, at least, this great pretender is having the last laugh. This copycat now sells 20 million units every year. Vegemite is now the family brand. Vegemite is as part of Australia as Marmite is to Britain. But can this Aussie gunge hit the spots that even its British rival can't reach? Right, you ready? OK. Chin, chin. Oi! How'd you like that? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's worse than the Marmite. Oh! As you call Australia home. Please tell me that you think that's so much worse than Marmite. That's so much better. Just like the Aussies always win in the ashes, they've won again. <laughs> It turns out Vegemite's even more intense flavour and its grainier texture is a turn-off for many Brits. But are there other ways to weaken the anti-camp? The lovers could earn another point if an unlikely recipe can convert a hater or two. To win over some of you haters, 
I've devised a great recipe. It's a chocolate brownie with a difference. Marmite. Marmite brownies? Yeah! Yeah. No. If you think of it more sort of in terms of toast or in stews and casseroles, who'd ever thought you could put it in caramel? Well, we've all heard of salted caramel, so I thought, why not the Marmite? I'm hoping I get a nice, pleasant surprise, but I'm not holding any high hopes. First up, one tablespoon of golden syrup. For those who prefer sweet to sour, hope beckons. Put the golden syrup and sugar in the saucepan. With baking's holy trinity of butter, eggs and flour. Sprinkle that through. What could possibly go wrong? And then what have we got left? Star of the show, Marmite, waiting. Let's be honest, it sounds horrible. Look at that. So this is going in here now. Ooh. I'm sorry, haters, but you're going to love it. Brownies are great. Why, why are we ruining it? Why, why put Marmite? Wow, the smells are going through the house. It's even brought the dogs in. I think he's even excited to try it. Love this part. Whoa. In you go, my beauty. Good girl. Oven's on. Preheated the oven, haven't we? Preheated oven, 170, it says. Yeah. It's going in for 25 minutes. But it does smell like brownie. My Marmite brownie. It's going in the oven. There, we have it. Love it, or hate it. The results of this brownie bonfire are in. There are two converts. I didn't want to admit the fact that them brownies were so good with Marmite on the top. What do you think of that Marmite brownie? Cakey. Is it good? For a person who can't stand Marmite, they were so, so nice. It's 5-4, despite a touch of hater sour grapes. If you're going to put Marmite in brownies, just don't put a lot in, then you don't taste it. Mm. Coming up, will mind games fool the doubters? If I tell you this product is going to taste especially sweet, or spicy. Those kind of descriptions of a food, their activity changes simply by what we're told about what we eat. That's clever. And can a hater ever become a lover? Oh my god, I have to put this out, I'm so sorry. <laughs> In the black and yellow world of yeast extracts, there are few grey areas. It's a culinary conflagration of those who love and those that hate. But is it just a case of mind over matter? Can psychology rather than gastronomy overcome hating hearts? There are lots of uh, triggers and drivers for our food behaviour. When you look in the brain, you can see changes in some of the... Uh, parts of the brain that care about flavour that are kind of you know, triggered by being told that what you're tasting at this very moment is brand X or Y. It's very much similarly if, you, if, if I tell you this product is going to taste especially sweet or spicy. Those kind of descriptions of a food, again, can change the activation you see even in some of the very earliest sensory areas that are coding the actual bitterness or sweetness of a food. Um, their activity changes simply by what we're told about what we eat. Welcome to the brave new world of food mind science, where it seems that if you think you won't like a food, it's likely you won't like it. Building on this knowledge, a stylish and novel viral video ad was designed to combat the wariness of the anti-camp. Hello, Marmite hater. Welcome to Marmite Mind Control. That's clever. That is very, very clever. It does not make you want to hurl. <laughs> Hater, you have become a lover. After watching that, could be delicious, could be yum. I think it's gonna work. 
It's, it's going to work. Yeah, come, come on. on. Try a bit. There we go. Oh no! Drum roll. Oh god. Get your arm ready because I'm probably going to spit this out. Oh god. Yummy. Mm, mm. Yummy, man. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. You don't hate it. You love it. No. He lied. We're going. He said, oh, that was so gross. <laughs> oh. Oh. No, that didn't work. <laughs> Horrible. Horrible, and I'm never doing that again. <laughs> oh, God. That was the worst three seconds of my life. Oh. <laughs> that didn't work. <sighs> I'm really not sure what the problem is. Well, that was a failure. But can a more intensive workout succeed? With the lovers one ahead, the deciding test is down to Maddie. Could a seven day boot camp make her adore the potent spread like her dad and give the lovers a convincing victory? I really do not like the taste. Okay. Oh my God. I have to spit this out, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Oh god. Oh my god, I found my eye water. That's not good. It's not better than yesterday. Today I'm gonna to try and take two bites. Don't harm me to that. Probably it's not gonna happen. Oh I'm going for the corners, but oh well. Two bites. That's progress. Oh god. Has she peaked too soon? It should not be a food. It doesn't deserve to be a food. Like, how dare you call yourself a food? Days five and six, and Maddie's boot camp's going backwards. Oh, oh God. There's no way I'm ever going to be able to eat a half slice of this, ever. So it is the end of day seven. I'm sorry, I tried, but I am still a hater of Marmite. I never want to see it again, so I'm going to even try and avoid it in the supermarkets. It's traumatising to eat. Oh well. Living proof the bridge from Marmite hell to heaven is an elusive structure. <coughs> Maddie is still a hater, adding another point to her side of the divide. Lovers and haters, it's an honourable, not to say very convenient, draw. This divisive product has been a British institution for over a century. Few brands can match its appetite for polarisation. Lovely jubbly. Oh, do you want a bit? Why not? It continues to split families and tear Britain asunder. I've only done it three times and every single time I end up putting on too much. Do you want another piece? No, that's where I've been good. Actually, I will. But love it or hate it, life with this sticky black stuff on the UK's breakfast tables will never be dull. Marmite is gooey, it's bitter, and it's love. Disgusting rotten fish. I think it's a geezer's food. A nice bit of Marmite on toast with a nice strong coffee. I love it. <laughs> you want your taste buds to have a party every morning, then you cannot just... go without having a tub of Marmite in your cupboard. Horrific. Sour and overrated. Oh, <gasps> come on. Are we a Marmite family or not? No. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. yeah. Thumbs up. We're a Marmite family. Sticky, beefy, awesome. There we go. It's great. I am a Marmite lover. I will love it till the day I die. I'll be the leader of the hater army of Marmite, and I'll make sure it's never seen on the face of the earth again. <laughs> I don't even know what else to say, apart from that was uh, an experience.